So welcome back. This is our final panel of the day, followed immediately by a reception. So um, very excited to have all of you, very excited for this panel in particular, and I'm going to let our moderator, Susana Vasquez from the Office of Civic Engagement, take it away. Um, I'm going to start off with a brief deck um, just to give a little bit of local context to this idea of, sh of community organizing and then we'll have each of the presenters introduce themselves. There's more information and background and bios and the materials you receive so we won't um, use time to, to talk about their great backgrounds. Um, so first of all, a little bit of my own background. Um, I studied history at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Um, yeah, nice. I was also a student activist there and sort of began my work that um, led me to community organizing in Chicago. Um, um, and I spent many years in Chicago working both as an attendant organizer, actually for those of you on the Woodlawn tour, working with Maddie Butler over 25 years ago, um, and then working in community development. Um, and so now I'm at the Office of Civic Engagement at the university, and I find it uh, reasonably ironic that I used to protest university administration, and now I am university administration. Um, the Office of Civic Engagement at the University of Chicago has a pretty simple mission. We steward um, a university-wide commitment to civic engagement. And simply put, that's our commitment to be a good citizen in the city of Chicago and a good neighbor on the south side of Chicago. Um, but like any large institution in a large, complex urban setting, we've had our own complex history with the neighborhoods around the university, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but first off, uh, we can't talk about community organizing in Chicago without mentioning a few of my heroes. Uh, Lucy Parsons Gonzalez, very active in the labor movement. Ida B. Wells, very active um, in the anti-lynching movement. Um, and Jane Addams, who really was the uh, sort of groundbreaking leader around settlement house movements and organizing immigrant communities here in the city. Um, but that isn't my job today, so we'll move on from my heroes. Because um, we're here at the University of Chicago. Um, this is the Midway, perhaps you've passed it. Uh, on one side is Hyde Park, uh, the Hyde Park community. On the south is uh, the Woodlawn community. And so the Midway in some ways stands as this very interesting sort of demarcation between two storied neighborhoods on the south side that have had this very long, intimate relationship with the University of Chicago and its growing campus. Um, so the University of Chicago, of course, is known for its illustrative set of scholars. Um, anyone can win $10 if you can name them all, or not, because it's disappeared. Um, but this includes um, everyone from John Dewey to uh, William Julius Wilson to more recently Eve Ewing, um, who've had a major impact on urban scholarship and how we think about neighborhoods. And if I would go to another slide, I would talk about what's next. Yay, okay. Um, but the biggest impact the University of Chicago may have had on uh, urban areas and neighborhoods could be how it approached um, its own sort of community challenge around um, the 1950s and 60s. Um, and this was when um, the South Side, like many parts of urban areas across the United States, were um, facing changes, changes in demographics, some of them caused by racial covenants um, and other uh, impacts. Um, and so this idea of the community problem and urban renewal became a big part of the university's strategy to really preserve the institution um, and keep its presence and eminence um, as a research university on the South Side. Um, urban renewal is a critical part of our history, in part because the university actually helped shape some of that policy. Um, so there were a few uh, urban renewal plans that were advanced in Hyde Park. There are community organizations there and local aldermanic sort of opposition, but there wasn't a real organized movement to stop and prevent the university from advancing its urban renewal plans. Got support from the state, got support from the federal government and the um, mayor at the time, um, and really radically changed that neighborhood. Um, um, displaced about um, uh, a third of families, about half African American, about half white, mostly low income, as well as a number of local businesses. But there was a different experience um, in Woodlawn, and um, another great contributor from Chicago to community organizing is this University of Chicago graduate. Another $10 if you know what he got his PhD in. Anyone? Anyone? Archaeology. No. And then he did a sociology fellowship. Yes, we can debate that later. 
Um, but he did get a PhD from here um, and uh, went on to study juvenile justice systems um, and started what became the Industrial Areas Foundation, um, which became sort of the, uh, the organizing training institute for this country. I went through IAF training back in my early 30s. And one of the first places he organized was in the Woodlawn community. Um, and he found a young leader at the time, Bishop Brazier, who had started up what is now the Apostolic Church of God, and was able to organize the community in a pretty amazing way um, to build enough power to sort of have a face off with the University of Chicago about its plans for urban renewal in Woodlawn. Um, and if any of you read Rules for Radicals, um, he really sort of used and set the playbook, which is still followed to this day. They turned this problem of the university unilaterally wanting to sort of purchase land and advance urban renewal, turned that problem into an issue, um, something they could take action on. They polarized the issue um, and were very clear about who the targets were. They targeted university administration, went to the city. Um, and they wound up pr proposing an alternative agenda and making positive recommendations of what they would want to see to allow the university to have some of its plans advance. They brought in the base of their allies, so it was more than just Woodlawn folks who wound up supporting them. Um, and at the end, it was sort of a brokered agreement um, with Mayor Daley, the city, the university, and Woodlawn leaders um, that um, sort of had at the time um, a sort of a line at 61st Street saying that's where the university would develop. Um, and for homes that were displaced, um, they secured and won affordable housing units that wound up being developed in part by leadership and entities that grew out of this organizing effort. Um, so fast forward today, so if that was sort of a, a, a key mark in our history and in community organizing in the city, um, what I find really fascinating about being at the university right now is how um, a lot of that legacy still informs Woodlawn, and those of you who are on the Woodlawn tour certainly saw this. Um, Bishop Brazier's son, Dr. Byron Brazier, pictured here, really kind of picked up his father's legacy and over the years has mobilized Woodlawn residents and developed various community plans. Um, as some of you have also heard or been aware of, uh, the Obama Presidential Center is being planned for and, and developed in nearby Jackson Park. Um, and that has uh, caused sort of also new organizing and activism, asking a real critical and sort of continuing question in the city of Chicago, um, which really informs organizing in this town, which is real estate development in neighborhoods um, tends to lead to this power struggle. And a lot of organizing kind of grows from that tension between those with power and those moving development and those who are in neighborhoods and sort of who will benefit from that. And so even right now in Woodlawn, in one neighborhood, um, some of these questions are playing out. And while CBA activists have ask the question, who will benefit from this development and propose their solutions, much of which does focus on preserving affordable housing in a neighborhood that has affordable housing in place. Um, Dr. Brazier has also been proposing a, a different approach. In fact, he was quoted in a recent article saying, we don't, we're thinking about how we grow the economy in a neighborhood, not taking 1950 styles of preserving affordable housing. So this question of organizing tactics being utilized by both sides in a neighborhood that itself really is a storied place where community organizing has impacted the neighborhood. Um, so I think that's some of the interesting history and context, um, though I will leave you with some of my new heroes, um, Charlene Carruthers, um, who informed by Kathy Cohen, University of Chicago faculty, um, was a big leader in black youth movement and black youth project, um, has a new book out on radical queer feminism. Uh, Amisha Patel, who leads the Grassroots Collaborative here in Chicago, um, going up against even current Mayor Lightfoot on how TIF, uh, tax increment financing and development funds are being flown in, uh, how those are flowing in the city, and, um, and um, Aisha, Aisha Butler, who has been a force for good in Inglewood, a south side community, and really organized residents to be active and engaged in the, developing the future of their communities. So again, I think Chicago has been a great contributor to community organizing. This university itself has also been a contributor. And with that local context, we're going to turn it over to our panelists. Slides are coming up. 
Uh, while the slides come up, my name is Teresa Williamson. I'm here from Rio, from Brazil. I'm an urban planner. I studied with Jeannie Birch at Penn, uh, but I've been back in Brazil for 19 years, where I'm originally from, uh, running a nonprofit called Catalytic Communities that I founded. Uh, we specifically work with favela organizers. Uh, we've worked over the years with thousands of local organizers from hundreds of communities across Rio. And before I start the presentation, I just wanted to commend Luis and Chris, uh, UN Habitat and Mansueto Institute, for this vision around the, the Million Neighborhoods Initiative. Um, when we think about a billion people living in, quote, slums, uh, it can feel like an overwhelming statistic. Uh, it's a very disempowering statistic. What do we do? How do these people, when we think about it as individuals, uh, cope with their outcomes? When we become aware that the reality is that they're not individuals that are isolated, they're living in a million in neighborhoods across the world and that these neighborhoods self-organize and they do this all the time every day and we become aware of how those communities do self-organize it can actually be a very empowering statistic and hopefully as I talk to you about Rio and how communities there self-organize uh, you'll gain you'll feel like I do um, about this so uh, I also want to say that I think at the neighborhood scale uh, is where people are empowered to take control of their lives and for people to have meaning and, and be active in their outcomes, uh, it's very important for us to strengthen this things at the neighborhood level. Um, I'll be talking about Rio, which is the 28th largest metropolitan region in the world. Uh, over the last, uh, over the morning, we've been hearing about governments that work. Um, we've heard people here referring to, you know, getting good data to government to be able to make good decisions. Unfortunately, Rio is a reality of a city that has not had effective government historically. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and so all of our work really is about how communities can self-organize in the context of failure by the state. Uh, so hopefully that'll help um, help in the discussions here. Uh, and yeah, and then finally, I guess I just wanted, before I start, ask you, does anybody recognize the plant that's on the back of the image? If you do, raise your hand, if you think you do. Okay. Does anybody recognize the city? Raise your hand. Okay. Rio. Uh, how many of you know that Rio was the largest slave port in world history? receiving one city, more than five times the number of enslaved Africans as the entire United States. Uh, and Brazil, slavery in Brazil lasted 60% longer than in the United States. The fact that we don't know this means that it's never been dealt with. It's never been really dealt with. Uh, and Rio today is the manifestation of this legacy. Um, Rio is the capital of Brazil, and uh, it was a fast-growing city already in the 1890s. Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery in the Western Hemisphere in 1888. Uh, so as Rio was the capital, it was growing, people moved there, uh, former slaves uh, looked for housing. Obviously, there was no affordable housing in 1890s in Rio in this post, uh, uh, in this context. Um, and so that plant that I showed in the first slide, that is the favela plant. Uh, the first neighborhood we refer to today as favelas uh, was called Favela Hill. It was, the term was coined in the 1890s when the community was settled uh, by former slaves who had served battle for the government of Brazil and Canudos, and they were told that they would receive land in payment. So they moved back to, they came to Rio looking for land, didn't get it, weren't paid, and they squatted and formed Favela Hill. All of the settlements ever since have become known as favelas. So I'm just gonna give a quick intro. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. I'm gonna show you lots of slides, and I'll sweep through a bunch of them because the presentation's available on Google Slides, and you can check it out later. I just wanna make sure you have access to the information. This slide, for example, I won't go into it in a lot of detail, but just to, we need to be aware in the context of Rio, these are consolidated communities, informal settlements there. They're no longer slums for the most part. People for the most part want to stay in their communities and improve them. Uh, and what we've really lived for 120 plus years is a cyclical policy of neglect, repression with some periods of investment. So actually 90% of housing in favelas today uh, ha are built of brick, concrete, reinforced steel. Uh, they have uh, sewage, they have um, 
pipes, uh, indoor plumbing, water, electricity, but the quality is low. The maintenance is poorly done, and people are constantly disenfranchised. So favelas are 24% of the city. Uh, the million neighborhoods statistic uh, fits well. We have about 1.4 million people in favelas in about 1,000 of these communities. Um, and so here we see that they're all over the city. Uh, the reds and oranges are favelas. And basically, it's a territorial manifestation of this legacy of slavery. You can see it on maps to this day uh, of Rio. Um, and this is, these are community organizers with signs saying favela residents are not at fault um, for the city's woes. So let's reintroduce favelas now based on our work uh, as a nonprofit working with local organizers. Uh, in the context of the globe, right, we, we know that a third of urban humanity currently lives in informal settlements. By 2050, more or less a third of all humanity will. This is where in Africa and Asia especially, uh, human population is growing. Uh, but in Rio, we have an opportunity because we have such established consolidated communities to think about how we manage as these communities do consolidate. Now, what they all have in common in Rio is very simple. It's nothing subjectively bad or good. They're neighborhoods that are there to meet the need for housing. Uh, there's no outside regulation. They're established by residents, and they vary dramatically based on where they're located, what kind of leadership they've had historically, uh, what kind of opportunities they have, and so on. Now, I'm not going to go into all these details, but basically, favelas have qualities that we have not, uh, we often ignore, that are actually embedded into these communities often by the way they develop organically. If you really look at human settlements until a couple of hundred years ago, they were all informal. Um, so we need to really reconsider our lens. These are just different community photos of favelas in different stages, different levels of investment, different levels of community organizing, different histories over time. So i just like to, ref to refer to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because I think it's important for us to be all pursuing uh, a world where the global goals are being met and people are being self-actualized. But we always have to look at the very basics when we're talking about low-income communities. And when you're talking about physiological needs, shelter is right there, right? Uh, we often conflate, especially in the global north, shelter with property, which is on the second rung. Um, and there is a basic rule, uh, which is 20% of people uh, cannot afford market rate housing in any city. Uh, and so in the global south, this need is met often through informal settlements. Uh, in the global north, it may be public housing, it may be rent controls, rent stabilization, cooperatives, community land trusts, and other features. So Catalytic Communities, our organization, is set up to basically support favela organizing from the ground up. Uh, we actually see ourselves as having a 30-year life cycle, 30 to 40 years as an organization. We're not set up to be there forever. We're set up to help favelas in Rio and ultimately globally realize a different paradigm of how we work with these communities and how we help them develop, but through a hyper-local perspective. So everything Catalytic Communities, our organization does, is supporting grassroots organizing in Rio, um, thinking about it, developing methodologies, working practically on the ground with local people, knowing who they are, knowing what the situations are, community by community, but in a way that we can think, how can we take these models and this knowledge uh, globally? So these are some of our early programs. Um, we, we evolving now into a period where we're focusing more on model development. So we're actually doing demonstration projects with favelas, which I'll talk about next. But in the mean, but first I just want to mention we're most known uh, for the work we did in pre-Olympic Rio, helping, in, helping cover issues around forced displacement. Um, so if you heard about evictions in Rio in the pre-Olympic years, it's very likely our organization was involved in that reporting. Now, uh, Again, so I'm, I'm going to finish talking a little bit about our organization to focus on one of our big projects, which I think relates the most to this uh, conference, which is the Sustainable Favela Network. But first, um, this is part of an exercise we did around the SDGs, where we went through as a, as a team over a period of months and analyzed how our work fits in. And what we found is essentially that the canopy of the tree is 
SDG number 11, our focus as an organization, our aspiration is sustainable cities and neighborhoods. And most of the SDGs fit within our framework into that. So we work on water issues, we work on uh, uh, different types of um, governance and, um, and uh, sorry, uh, f uh, f preservation and other issues, but also, but mostly around uh, through the sustainable cities lens. But in the meantime, but in the process, we realized that we can't do any of that without social justice. And so the trunk of the tree is SDG 16. We simply can't do 11 without 16. Uh, and in the process, we also realized there are a number of elements that are missing from the SDGs as we localize them in communities. Um, and three that we identified were around community control and autonomy, uh, direct channels to government, and fair, nuanced media representation. Uh, also, as background, and this relates directly to the, organize, the history of Chicago organizing, everything we do goes through an asset-based community development framework, which is the opposite of what you're seeing on the screen now. Right now, you're seeing the typical international development framework as opposed to asset-based community development. So rather than focusing on what communities are deficient in, I've heard a lot today about needs assessments. Well, what about asset? What about assets? Why aren't we talking about the needs of communities without recognizing their assets there? And the reason this is so dangerous is because then you get policies that unravel community assets that are hard to build, they're hard to legislate, they're hard to create, they come naturally. In the process of building solutions, and then we, become, we shoot ourselves in the foot. So just want to talk about that for a second. Um, and again, these slides will all be available later. Uh, in the interest of time, let's focus on the Sustainable Favela Network. This is what I wanted to share with you today. Um, it's part of a three-pronged strategy we have around narrative shifting, sustainable solutions at the grassroots, and community land trust as a preservation strategy for, for informal settlements. And these feed into each other. So as an organization, we spent years working with grassroots organizers, supporting their work on the ground, only to have government come in and evict communities we thought of as consolidated, high-functioning favelas. Uh, and so we realized that the narrative is so important, we had to backtrack and help people understand what these communities are and what their potentials are. So that's why you see there both Three on Watch, which is our reporting platform, and then the Sustainable Favela Network. But then, as communities become consolidated, there are people in favelas in Rio that have fought against land titles because they know that their goal is permanence and they live in high gentrification prone favelas. So we realize we actually need to also think about how do you firm, as communities become integrated and consolidated and are able to develop, how do you give them that security? So again, I'm going to focus now on the Sustainable Favela Network. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this, pro this program. It started, uh, well, actually, it started way back with the founding of Catalytic Communities in 2000. We started working with grassroots organizers, seeing all these communities through solution, an asset framework. But by 2012, when the UN had their Rio Plus 20 summit, uh, we had realized there were quite a few communities that were building sustainably and building resiliently. And so we put out a call, and 50 communities responded, and we ended up filming a, a documentary, which is available online, called uh, Favela is a Sustainable Model, which features eight of these projects that are very diverse across the city. And that led us to realize, sorry, just going back to that, that led us to realize that there was this, um, that these communities actually didn't know each other. So you had all these organizers that were working together, uh, that weren't working together, but knew, that may have heard of each other, right? Um, related to that, a couple of years later, a lead ND architect, one of the architects who actually created the certification, reached out to us and led this comparison of a favela with a LEED ND certified neighborhood in Rio to find that the favela actually had better linkages and other elements that made it more sustainable. Um, again, related to this issue of favelas, double standards, and so on. So there's a, a lot of talk in Brazil and in Rio about favelas being in areas of risk. Actually, some, some, some engineers have found that favela, when people settle, they actually reduce risk on the land. They're pushed onto those lands, of course, because th those are lands that are not interesting to developers. So there's that issue. But then communities have also stopped eviction, stopped um, landslides through environmental improvements themselves. So these things are all very uh, community by community, context by context. Now this is uh, 
how many of you heard in the pre-Olympic years about all the pollution in the bay that made it so the athletes couldn't, were getting sick? Raise your hands. Okay. So there was this article in the Atlantic, and then we had a lot of issues, obviously, around this in favelas as well. But how many of you know that there's a favela in Rio that's built a biodigester and that's, clean, that's treating its sewage, and it's actually the cleanest sewage in the city? Because we have a problem in Rio where the vast majority of sewage in general isn't treated. It's not just a problem of favelas, it's a problem of bad governance. So in 2017, we mapped. We went out and we mapped all of the communities in Rio that had sustainability and resilience projects. Uh, it's a sustainable favela network map. Uh, we developed a report showing that basically uh, most of these projects are in the first few years of development, but there are a lot of people with ideas. This is a growing movement and concern in favelas. Uh, we've profiled many of these projects on our, our reporting platform, Rio on Watch. You can see some of them here. Um, and then last year, we started bringing these folks together through a series of exchanges, which led, which has a short film about, um, and then which led to the first meetup. So November last year, 130 people from all over the favelas of Rio got together to learn about each other's work and figure out what we might do together as a network. So since then, the network has expanded. We have had over 600 people involved over the course of this year. Uh, we've had a number of exchanges where we take people from different favelas to each other's communities to learn about what they're doing around solar, around adaptive reuse, around uh, parks and, and gardens, around uh, public art, and a number of other elements. Um, and we've developed seven working groups that you can see here. Each of these working groups is coming up with a vision for what they could do across favelas um, as, 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 a, as a collective unit. So we have, for example, four or five solar organizations in Rio. How could they get together uh, that are already in favelas, or most of them are from favelas, uh, but some are technical allies. How could they get together to expand solar across the city, that kind of thing. Uh, so these just going to finish up with a few slides of some of the projects in the Sustainable Favela Network, different activities that they're involved in, whether it's co-ops or uh, uh, community museums, solar, water, community gardens. This is a, um, a rooftop garden, a, a green roof with 50 species of plant on it that's 15 degrees Celsius cooler than the surrounding area in midsummer in Rio. And these are all community-led, community-initiated projects. Environmental education, tech, community museums. There are 12 community museums in Rio. So if these communities are temporary, et cetera, et cetera, why in the world would people dedicate their time to preserving their history? So our next big event is the, this year's meetup. We're expecting hundreds of people. We, we don't have space for everybody. Um, and then next year we're hoping to have, well, we're hoping, we're planning an international seminar in June for anyone who wants to come check out the network in person. Um, and then finally, just on the scaling element, because this is obviously something, we're working hyper-local in communities on the ground to develop local solutions. Um, but we see the work we do as part of a sort of a broad, uh, a broad, um, ecosystem of initiatives, projects, organizations, like all the ones here today around the world that are working towards the same goal. So we focus locally. We're constantly learning from each other, from our communities, from other organizations. And then we believe in scaling by example. We don't need to have a massive infrastructure uh, outside. So just concluding thoughts. You know, let's drop the double standards. We talk about things like tactical urbanism and hacking and all these things that actually People, favelas are these things, right? Um, we just need to reframe the way we think about informal settlements so that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. We also need to recognize they're like at the top of the, they're citizen controlled spaces. So for those of you not familiar, this is Shira Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation, and the top three rungs are real participation. And favelas, when they're well managed by residents, they actually have a very high degree of citizen control, which is a, a good thing. Um, it can be very effective. Uh, and then finally, you know, what if Rio uh, recalibrated the way it looks at favelas, right? What if we actually develop these, this, the city based on these attributes? It could be a model for the world. I mentioned, you know, a third of humanity will live in informal settlements by 2050. So we need to look for alternatives. And then finally, I mentioned our sustainable favela network. Um, 
seminar next June. We also are working towards an indicator, which I'd love to talk to some of you about, but it's a longer term project. Um, and yeah, and anything else? Uh, I'd love to hear questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Now we'll have uh, Rose come up from SDI. Hi, Mara, I'm a BBT. Can you help to press the buttons? <laughs> Thank you very much, Program Director. Uh, I remind each, each other I'm still Rose Molokwani from South Africa and I'm the member of the management committee of SDI. SDI is an organization of people who never thought that they will be people one of the good days. Because we, we were not recognized by the formal world because we are belonging to the informal world. And then how we should connect the formal and the informal. It's not about being an individual. It's not about sitting in your house with your two children and your husband or being a single mother, but it's about organizing Hence, the idea of organizing came in, into being when we came together in 1991. And then we started to discuss amongst each other to say, who are we? We are homeless, we are landless, we are poor, but we are not hopeless. Meaning that we should come together and create our own agenda and the agenda that will make us to be recognized and to be listened to. But the agenda that will make us to create trust between ourselves and the government that is ruling us in our different countries. We, we you know, I'm not used to looking at this. I just want to talk. If I look at this, I become abstract. We, we, we have agreed that we should really start to talk. Because if we are not talking, we become dependent. And we allow other people to define our own lives. We allow other people to decide on what we have to have in our daily lives. So in, in SDI, we, we said to ourselves, this is high time that we stand up organizing ourselves. What, how, how should we organize ourselves? We are not just a talk show coming together, talking amongst each other, but we have to have issues that forces us to act. And then one of the important tools that make us to act is savings. A lot of people are looking at poor people like objects or subjects of discussion. But we are saying we are part and parcel of development of different communities, even our cities. Because as I was saying, informal and formal, the cities are too formal for the informal people. But the informal people are the ones that makes the formal city to be beautiful, being domestic workers. If I'm not there at your city, your house is not clean, your street is not clean. So we have to get the way to connect. So savings, we use it as a leverage. It's, 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 a, it's just a means to an end. It's not that, because poor people can't save uh, how much, $1,000 per day, no. But we can save one rent, 50 cent, and if we are together, we can make a lot of money. And then we are using these savings as a leverage to open doors to engage. Because we, we are really not beggars when we come to the formal world. We are not begging for support. We are saying, let's create partnerships. 
But how can we create partnership if we don't have an agenda? Our agenda is around homelessness, landlessness, and poverty eradication. And savings is one of the tools that makes us to define this agenda. How can we achieve this agenda? It's by learning from each other. Alone you can't do it, but if you are together, you share ideas. Hence, even during the day when we were visiting the Woodland community, exchange programs is one of an important tool to learn from each other. We don't only learn on what other people are doing. We also learn different cultures. We also learn how other cities are treating their poor people. We learn from each other on how to improve our own lives. Not just visiting each other, but we should know ourselves. And then the other very, very critical and important tool that brought me here as I'm sitting, data collection. I think the people who invited me here, I don't know, I, I, I just got an invitation. Then I said, Secretary, do it. I will just go. I don't know where I'm going, <laughs> but I'm going there. So when I came across to Amy, I said, this little girl, she ran away from South Africa to come here, and she's now pulling me. I don't know what she's doing here. <laughs> but when, when, when they were talking about data, I said, whose data is it? Because it's my data. And what do you want me to do with my data? Do you want me to promote your position where you are working? Or do you want to listen to the information that I gathered and we join hands together and make it work for both of us? What kind of relationship do we want to achieve from this symposium? Because Eniwa and her colleagues were talking about, we have been working with you around data, information collection, mapping. And then whose map is it? Whose information is it? It's my information, my map and I want you to help me to make it formal so that it can be recognized. Because when I do it manually, municipalities won't accept it. So that's where the data is forcing us to create partnership. There's a lot of engagements that are happening out there. And most of the engagement is around relationships. Relationship and partnership is two different things. That's what I learned. Ne? You should help me. If I'm wrong, you'll correct me. Relationship is when we know each other. You know me, but you don't understand me. So we don't want to have relationship of giving me lunch and, and this book and a pen and that pink bag. No. We need the partnership that will come up with a result that create a process of the implementation of this discussion. How are we going to do it? After tomorrow, are we going to have another symposium? Or are we going to have a process to say, yes, the mapping is there, the information is there, what next? Because we can collect and collect and collect and then, so what? In our communities, we are saying, when we collect information and we draw our maps, we help each other to identify priority projects. Hence, we need the next step from collecting this information. The projects that will be replicated not a project that will be implemented in a small community and it ends up there. The projects that will influence the policies. I'm happy to, to have heard the mayor from Francis Town. Freetown, oh my God, I'm mixing all this with. From Freetown, I was amazed and said, ah, what we are doing is very important. You know, I took myself for granted that what I'm doing at the community level can't convince other mayors or other politicians. 
but it is really working. And I'm proud of it because it has worked in 33 countries where we are operating. We are talking about partnership. We, are, we, have, we have created partnership amongst ourselves as communities. Because if we are divided, no one will listen to us. But if we are together, our voice is so strong that when we talk, somebody will listen. Like when I'm shouting now and everyone is listening attentively, even if I'm lying to you, <laughs> but you are also. But what I'm trying to, to emphasize is that if we work together strongly, we can achieve a lot of things. If we work together, we can make sure that the SDGs are pro-poor. For now, there's a very big gap between the member states, local government, and communities. How are we going to connect the three spheres of government? It's so challenging that they are all sitting in different tables, talking different languages for the same achievement. And then who suffer the consequence? I suffer the consequence because when they don't agree, it's like two bulls that are fighting and the grass is suffering. So we have to change the mindset of the thinking of our government. And today we are here at the university. We are saying the university, I don't know whether it's the PhDs or the students or the lecturers or whoever who's in here, your theory should be changed into practice. A lot of people are saying they are doing the research. Where are you taking the outcome of that research? Are you taking it back to the university and putting it on the archive? Or are you bringing it back to me where you have made a research from? If it is not like that, can we create a process whereby the researchers become the implementers. Because at the end of the day, you can write a book about me, and if you don't bring it to me, no one will read it. No one will ever know that you have done it with me. But if you bring it back, I saw a lot of beautiful maps uh, in the earlier presentations. Nice maps with nice colors. Do the people, ordinary communities, understand all those maps? Sometimes it is difficult. We just look at, oh, it's so nice. Yes, nice, nice, nice. Then we put it aside because we don't understand it. How can we open a process for more education to our people to understand the map? And then again, the data collection. Most of the data is out of fission. Ne? It is not improved. But if we work together every day at my community, I know how many children died. I know how many children were born. I know how many women are cheating to their husband or husband <laughs> cheating to their women. I know how many women are pregnant. But you, as a researcher, you left that two years ago. You don't know the additional number of the people. So if we can do the review of the, the data that we are collecting together, that will be good enough. And the only thing that is, need, is needed is finance. We can talk and talk and talk, but if we don't have finance to achieve all what we are talking about right here, right now, it will be a talk show, not a work show. So I, I would like to emphasize that SDI is ready to join hands with all of you. SDI, all of us, we are unprofessional professionals. <laughs> if you don't work with us, you will always get frustrated because you will never know where should you take what you are doing? Any, you invited us here. You have to really work with us. You have to engage with us. Don't just talk 
with us, but work with us. Let us not create a talk show, but a work show. If, if we create that after this symposium, the SDGs will have a very good positive result. Because the SDGs, how do they call them? Sustainable Development Goals. And who are the goalkeepers? We have to find out the goalkeepers. The people themselves are the goalkeepers because the implementation of these SDGs are done at the community level. When we look at the city, climate change, I had people talking about climate change. I want to finalize with this one. In one of the meetings in New York, they were saying climate change, a lot of government are having a problem when it comes to adaptation. They say, oh, you know, it is so easy dealing with mitigation. But adaptation is so, what is the difference between mitigation and adaptation? Mitigation is improving the beautiful city that is already beautiful. Adaptation is going to the informal settlements that have struggled for almost 50 years without a road, without a toilet, without water, without electricity. And at the end of the day, when government comes join with the uh, technicians, they talk about alternative technology. And then you come up with all, I'm sorry to put it in a blunter way, all this nonsense of technology things and dump it in the settlement. Why can't we start implementing them at the city level? Practice them. I know that some of the people are using solar panels, but most of them that are using that are those that are at the rural area. Those who are using water tanks are those that are in the rural area, but they are not there at the city level. But when you go to the city level, you'll get a lot of beautiful uh, roads overlapping to each other. You don't know whether it goes to right or to left. And now and then, it's an improvement of the same road using the money that could have been spent to upgrade the informal settlement, to address, to help the communities to adapt to climate change. Adaptation should become a priority to all of us. Researchers, come and help us write a book or whatever information around adaptation. Can we put aside mitigation a little bit? Because a lot of funding is spent under mitigation. And the mapping that you have done with us at the community level, let's use those maps to ad identify adaptation process and make it to replicate and replicate and not just one project and we close it down. But the project that will go a long way. Finally, I'm going to request uh, Chris William, UN Habitat. We have been working with UN Habitat <laughs> since I don't know which year, when we started our organization. GLTN, uh, ACFI, the, the first governing council we attended, the first habitat we attended, all the habitats. All the, what, what is another one? World Urban Forum, all of them. We were making noise. Noise, 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 noise. Little result. <laughs> what are we going to do from here? The first thing that I'm requesting is to have an exchange program with the woodland. Is it woodland? Woodland. Yeah. I would like to have an exchange with Rose Mulugan from woodland. I have started an organization in Manchester. I've got eight saving groups from Manchester women. It's not difficult to start it here. The only thing is to get somebody who can say, let's take it forward. Because poverty, even if you name it in English or in Zulu or in Swahili or in all the languages in the world, it means the same thing. So if we are poor, we have to come up with strategies on how to address this poverty. And the only thing that can help us is to have 
good information. Formal information, informal information, let's marry them. Let's allow the poor people to talk and listen to them. I love you all because you are listening to me. And I don't just want you to listen and do nothing. I want you to listen and when we finish here, tomorrow when we go and get the outcome, I have to be at the center of the decision and the center of the implementation. Is it going to happen eh? <laughs> We've got municipalities here that I saw. I don't know whether we've got national government here. Huh? No. We've got researchers. We've got politicians. We've got officials. I don't know. All who are here, can we start to prepare ourselves for the World Urban Forum? And when we go there, we just we should not just run around with the sessions. Because that's what happens. You go to one session to the other. And after the World Urban Forum, what is that? The declaration that stays with Chris William in UN Habitat. <laughs> no. It has to be a declaration that will help all of us who are here to implement the outcome of the discussions. Guys, for me, I'm sick and tired of talking. I want to work because I'm used to work. Next time when you invite me and we have not done anything, any, I will never come. Chris, you invite me and there's nothing on the ground. Apologies in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, and last, we'll hear from Mary Rowe. These are very hard acts to follow. Um, I've just got to say, um, <clears throat> I'm going to speak very specifically about um, our, my experience uh, living in Canada and the United States. So it's limited already in its scope. But I, I just want to talk a, bit, a little bit about um, what I read in the, in the material that Grace uh, sent out and Luis sent out, that one of the purposes of this meeting and of the Million Neighborhoods focus towards WOOF is strengthening the role of neighborhoods in urban planning and policy who share a curiosity curios and an enthusiasm for new tools and knowledge. And it's a, it's a very humbling thing to come to Chicago and talk about community organizing, uh, for heaven's sake, because Saul Alinsky's from here. But I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the questions that I've asked in the cities in which I've lived um, and how I've approached this. And I've, I've asked myself two key things. Who is community? How do we define who community is? Because I think community is very, very diverse. Sectorally, uh, it's diverse by age and gender and all sorts of other things. But it's not just local neighbors anymore. It's a whole lot of other factors which we're hearing about today. So who is community? I ask us to think about that. And then the second thing I want us to think about is organizing. What does organizing actually mean? And um, I have lived in a couple of different places. I'm a Canadian. I live in Toronto now, but I was uh, in the US for 15 years. And I was in New Orleans uh, post-Katrina. And I was in New York in the middle of Sandy, uh, working in both cases, working in one you know, with philanthropy, with a second in civic society, where actually Jeannie, Jeannie Birch, uh, like Teresa, uh, was my board chair. And, um, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my, my experience in those jurisdictions and in those contexts. But I feel so much resonance with what both Teresa and Rose have talked about, uh, and of course, um, what we see here in Chicago. So um, I, I now lead something called the Canadian Urban Institute. I'm in my fifth week, so cut me some slack. Um, <laughs> Canada's a big place. I haven't been everywhere yet, um, but I'm planning to get there. And uh, um, it's a 30-year-old organization focused on research, focused on applied research. But interestingly, when it was created, and for the first 27 years of its existence, 28 years of, of its existence, the Canadian was to tell folks in the developing world and in different parts of Europe who was coming to help, because in fact, it didn't do that much in Canada. It was funded through development assistance and various things, and it did international work. And it's only in the last few years that it started to say, oh, I guess we should actually look in our own backyard and start to learn a little bit about what's happening in cities in Canada. So it's got three focuses, exploring data and research, solving problems and knowledge sharing. And part of what I feel I'm in, and I feel like I've been through my career, I feel like I'm in the connective tissue business. 
That's what I do is look for platforms to allow us to scale by example. I love that. Uh, and what Rose was talking about, about how can we actually move ourselves to collective action, to learning from one another, and then accelerating our capacity to be able to adapt. I'm totally with you on adaptation, totally. So I think when we think about organizing, I just want to echo what Teresa was suggesting. What are we organizing for? And I think what we're organizing for is to enable self-organization. Whether you're in the developing world, in the global south, in the north, whether you're in a big city, whether you're in a small community, self-organization is what settlements are about. It enables us to be able to find ourselves, meet our needs, realize our aspirations. This is what we are all trying to catalyze and enable in built environments, in human settlements. And that the further, this is my lovely sketch of self-organization, that the further down you go, down that, that schema, what you want to do is create more connective tissue between us that enhances our capacity to be able to self-organize. If we're, if we're isolated, obviously we can't accomplish what we know we can uh, when we're connected. And when we think about what you're trying to do in those interactions, you're trying to create opportunities for serendipity where it's not controlled, it's not actually predetermined, it's interactions that you have that then help you evolve and think differently and act differently and have resources that you might not have had had you not stumbled into something. So I told you that I'd worked in New Orleans and I did five years post-Katrina. This is what happened. This is the failure of the levee system that was, I think, North America's first visceral experience of what climate change would look like. This is in 2005. That's 14 long years ago. And that's what it looked like. 180,000 units lost, thousands of people displaced, having to live in different places, find homes, find, them, find their families. You all saw it on the news. And what I found is I, I went there to learn and to listen, and it was an extraordinary opportunity in, in a developed country to be able to watch how would self-organization manifest? What would it look like? And what we found it looked like was things like this, a coffee shop owner who basically served coffee for a year and a half, never charged anybody anything, just went in, put the coffee pots on, and people had the need to come and exchange with one another and self-organize. And there was no layer of bureaucracy or government to do it for them. They had to just come and find, their, find each other. Um, and then it started to formalize a little bit. And these were uh, networks of um, what they called beacons of hope. So they were started by homeowners who, or tenants, it wasn't always homeowners, people that had lived in a particular place and had this, which I think we all share, a strong attachment to place. They wanted to come back to their place. And they didn't have necessarily the skills or the resources to do that, but what they recognized is that if they pooled their resources and pooled their knowledge, they could, they could learn from one another and move more quickly. That, to me, is about community organizing. There was no entity organizing them from above. This came right up from the dirt, right up from the ground. Um, and there were 17 or 18 of these that started in people's basements and, well, they didn't have basements, uh, garages and backyards, and in this case, front yard, um, which they called, as you, see, you may not be able to see, their Cafe Katrina. And it was really a meeting spot. And, these are the people that, they're diverse people, people of varying backgrounds, artists, religious leaders, um, uh, the woman on the left would say herself, housewife, um, activists, uh, uh, environmental ad advocates, um, community organizing, more traditional community organizing, who basically found their way in that extraordinary environment. I used to suggest that that period from 20, 2005 to 2010, New Orleans was a prophetic city. It was experiencing what is happening and is going to continue to happen all around the world in a particular a shock. A rece they received an extraordinary shock and had to, had to navigate their way out of it in a way that where there was no playbook, no, no prescribed notion of how to do it. And this was the graph that I drew at the time to try to persuade my board. Um, I was working, as I said, for a foundation. I was trying to persuade my board that instead of them coming in and telling the community what they should be doing with their money, that they would actually stand back and let the community indicate how they wanted the money to be spent. And I used this little illustration because I had witnessed it, that the organizing that was happening took two forms. People formed hubs 
where they would exchange, where there was lots of affinity and common experience and they would need to commiserate and share information, just like those beacons of hope uh, that I suggested. And then they needed links. They needed the capacity to be able to, once they realized what they had amongst them, they would then identify, well, you know what we don't have? We don't have A, B, C, D, E, and they needed a longer link to another part of a city or another part of a neighborhood. And I think this network is exactly what my colleagues are talking about that the favela network that you've created, Teresa, and what Rose is talking about globally, is that we need these kinds of links. This, this frame that you're creating at Mansueto around a million neighborhoods creates that long link. And we're, what we're trying to suggest is that collectively, we can scale by example, we can innovate and learn and adapt, and we can also highlight to so many others who are unaware that when we're together, communicating together, it's a much stronger message. We can teach much more effectively to people that are not sharing our experience what it actually looks like. And this kind of connective tissue, planners in the room recognize what this is. Um, we do this, we, we manufacture this in various forms of infrastructure. The question is, can we do it in a flexible and an adaptive way, and can we pay for it? And can we move to a place where we can do it differently? People that went to the World Urban Forum in Medellin remember this. Here's a brilliant piece of connective tissue. It also looked like this. This is a very fundamental, to me, this is a manifestation of my little sketch. This is, there are hubs of activity in these cities and in these communities, informal, formal, and they need innovative kinds of connective tissue that allow us to interact differently and not be stuck or isolated. And you know, we, this is, a, Jeannie will remember this trip, we were on it together. And uh, uh, what's great about it is that those escalators that connect um, the parts of Medellin that were isolated up the mountain um, have then catalyzed all sorts of more self-organization and in this case really colorful self-organization as communities have started to attach themselves to place in a different kind of way. So the other piece of work that I, that I did when I was in New York and that we're continuing to look at in Canada is the extent to which the built environment continues to shape these kinds of opportunities to self-organize. Um, you know, I'm not a determinist. I know there are many people in the room that probably are around the importance of built form, but I do think that we need to create these spaces where we can come together, where serendipity can occur, and where informality actually manifests in highly formal environments. So this notion that social interaction is necessary to how a community self-organizes, and it takes different forms. And I worry that as development becomes increasingly privatized, and public, public entities become f uh, less resourced, that we, we see these kinds of spaces becoming more and more difficult to access. And what I'm interested in, though, is even, um, even when a private developer or a private owner creates some kind of place, um, inevitably, if enabled, communities and, of users around will try to transform that space to make it a better shared space, a more collaborative space. And we heard it today for those of us that did the tour in the housing community. I, I just loved this story that, that there they are doing a redevelopment and a squash club moves in. And the local community say, well, we don't play squash. Lots of people don't play squash. And, uh, and, but they went, to that, they went to the vendor and said, okay, well, we've got to find a way to make this a more shared space. We've got to, so okay, we won't boot the squash folks out. Obviously, they need to pay the revenue and be the tenants that, that are the anchor tenant that generates the revenue. But we want other kinds of activities, and they were amenable. And I think that these kinds of activities, they have, you, you will recognize some of these. They have public investment. They have private investment. But the key thing is that we're together uh, holding, you know, pushing for shared spaces that have different kinds of uses and varied uses. And we called that in, in New York the civic commons. And we all have elements of the civic commons in our neighborhoods and in our communities. They could be libraries, they could be um, recreation centers, but they also can be watering holes or coffee shops or uh, places where people play sport or they informally and formally form up and they together form a system. There's a whole raft of them that exist, like this is the more modern version obviously. Um, um, but this is, a, this is a great example, back to Medellin. I love this, that when you got on those cable cars um, at the station, how many of you have been to Medellin and been on these cable cars? So you know, it's a library. I just love this. So, and I was riding these cars and there were kids on there in their school uniforms and they, were, they had not been able to get to school prior to this. They'd have to schlep themselves down and walk for several hours. And sure enough, you pick up a book and you read it on the, on the cable car, just brilliant. And then tech, obviously, is critically important. I wish we could get our tech people to think carefully about what they're optimizing for. 
They are not optimizing for their own tech benefit. I just, I'm looking to my friends who are in tech. You know, surely to God, it's not about the efficiency of the system that you're after. It's about how we actually catalyze what we believe fundamentally is the unit of, of human settlement, which are people. Um, these are a couple of last slides just to reflect on why I think this matters. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, when I went to my board about, about New Orleans, um, New Orleans was being inundated by experts who were swanning in saying, here's what we should do. And it took enormous pushback to be able to say the experts are right here. And if that isn't what community organizing should be about, I don't know what it sh else it should be about. It has to be about finding ways to privilege local knowledge and for those of us that are in the other professions to support and enable that local knowledge to become, become material and made material. And that this, I, I always use this one because, you know, lots of people on the right love David Brooks. And uh, I just want to say he's a good conservative uh, opinion leader talking about let's think about the locals. Let's, fo let's uh, stay focused on the locals. So there was some talk about this this morning. Um, I'm not a great graphic person, as you can see, but I think there has to be... <laughs> There has to be a balance between these things. And this is a trope, and I worry, I even wanted to take this slide out. I changed my presentation a bit last night. I wanted to take this one because I thought this is such a sorry, tired, yin-yang conversation. But fundamentally, we need the resources of both, and we need to find ways to create that common space and that common dialogue, obviously. And you can see it here in terms of even the dynamics we observed when we went to look at the, uh, the housing redevelopment. You could see this yin-yang happening. And how can we actually continue to tip the balance to favor bottom-up? But at the same time, you've got to have what was mentioned this morning. You've got to be able to have a mechanism to create the strategic larger frame, the regional frame, because local communities can't always see the, le the regional frame or they're so besotted with their own, their own immediate needs that it's difficult for them. So we have to find ways to not have this autocratic, but to have it collaborative and obviously eliminate this. It's my only anxiety about the presentation this afternoon when they were heralding this great success that they got a housing department at the city. Mm. You know what? There are trade-offs when you do that, when you create, you know, we hopefully, if we are place-based people, then we should be the connective tissue that straddles and breaks down every silo. And I'm not sure that creating independent departments is always the solution. These last few slides, I see the amount of time, these last few slides to me are what's, why this is important and what's at stake. Um, we, had a, we had a national election in Canada a couple of days ago. Did you hear about it? You all love our cute little prime minister, don't you? I know you do. I know you do. I read an interesting statistic about the election this morning. Um, I've got this slide up because Canada receives, uh, just, receives a high proportion of immigrants every year. We have, have a very ambitious immigration policy we have for years, and Prime Minister Trudeau is a great advocate of that, and his opposition um, was not. Prime Minister Trudeau lost the popular vote. He won the seats, but he lost the popular vote. You can see that our country does not receive immigrants to the same, uh, at the same levels. And I read a statistic this morning that if you take the densest regions in Canada and you, by, by density, and you list them from the densest down to the least dense, the liberals and the left, the left-leaning parties, the liberals and the NDP, which is the government, which is what Prime Minister Trudeau will form a coalition with, with the two left parties, they took 65, the top 65 most dense communities were won by a liberal or by an NDP, by a leftist candidate. You have to go to, to community, community 66 to find a conservative candidate who won. But the conservatives won the popular vote. So we have a significant challenge in North America that our political system is looking like this, or like Britain, like this. That little, tiny little bit of London is the only, is the, is the labor component. And when we think about what that's really about, what that really is telling us, it's telling me that if we don't start to look at our capacity to organize across rural and urban, across class and across race. If we don't start to be able to find a way to reach out in the North to um, people that have been left behind by the global economy, if we don't, if we don't spread our wings that way, um, we're imperiling all the progress we've made. 
It can be torn down in a, in a nanosecond. And then I have these two last slides, which is this attachment to place and what we really are dependent upon is people I identify with, they, they form an identity and a sense of meaning in their lives by where they're from. And that has to be what our fundamental premise is. And I love this one. Um, <laughs> this is in New Orleans. This is not long, you can see it's not long after the storms because there's debris out on the front street. This area um, uh, flooded up to six or seven feet and then the water eventually left out. And at that time when all the experts were coming in, there were lots of folks saying, oh, why would we even rebuild New Orleans? Why would we bother? And I snapped this shot because people are so resilient and committed to their place, as we all are. So thanks very much. So if my mic is on, um, we have about 15 minutes. And so and I know we want to leave some time for, for questions. So let me just do one question each, and then we'll open it to the audience. Um, and so I'm going to start off with, um, with Rose. Um, you mentioned. Uh, about uh, asking critical questions and this, this question between sort of like connecting the formal and the informal. Um, and one of the things I always wonder about is what was your original motivation? Um, I don't think many of us say, mommy, I wanna wake up and be a community organizer. Um, what first motivated you to take a community organizing approach to the place you were attached to, the people you were attached to? Uh, I'm coming from a family of 10 people, eight brothers and one sister. And my mother and my father, my mother died when I was 10 years old. So I have to become a mother of nine children, <laughs> starting to cook for them at the age of 10 and washing for them, staying at a community that is so vulnerable, where it is a five kilometer away from the small town. And during that time, we didn't have services. Mm -hmm. One tap was shared by 250 families. Mm -hmm. When we want to shit, we shit in a bucket. Mm -hmm. You can count how many shit are there in the bucket. <laughs> No electricity, nothing at all, but the town was five kilometers with electricity and everything. And now the municipality wanted to evict us from that community. Mm -hmm. Then we started to come together and say, we are going to fight against eviction. Mm. Today, we are still staying there. Okay. And the municipality thought they are bringing development. Yes, there's flush toilets. Mm less electricity, but the shit is still running on the street. With flush toilet, electricity is on and off. If it's a lot of wind, it's off. So I was encouraged also by my brother who was killed because of activism. So I learned from it. Then I said, I'm carrying forward the legacy of my brother. Okay. And then more, moreover, when we started to organize in different countries, I could see the poverty mm. that is within me. Mm. So I was pushed by the poverty okay. that was within me. Mm. I'm not educated. I don't have a PhD. I don't have a degree. But I realized that I've got a doctorate in community organizing because it's within me. Thank you. Teresa, you talked about your organizational model uh, in some ways having a life cycle and that you should end a life cycle and sort of almost work yourself out of business, which is sort of the opposite of Alinsky's notion of kind of creating institutions of institutions that actually had that longevity of going beyond the one charismatic leader. Um, so there is this question about um, has community organizing changed from some of the sort of storied leaders and how do you see yourself adapting maybe other models of community organization to serve the favelas and um, the vision that you are doing to kind of scaffold and help local folks have that power to be self-determining? Okay, it's a great question. Um, so many things come to mind in response, but um, 
well, catalytic, I'm, I'm, I, even though I inspire myself on community organizers and I like to feel like a community organizer, I'm not in the communities that are organizing. Mm -hmm. And I have to be aware of that. So I see my role as trying to unravel the privilege that I have and, and help change that dynamic, right? And, and so, so communities we work with, they are constantly struggling with uh, getting more leadership, developing, mobilizing, building unity, all of these things. We're supporting them in that process. So I don't think of our organization as something that needs to continue. What we're doing is we're part of a, an ecosystem that needs to continue. We're part of a movement that needs to continue. In fact, as long as we think it has to be an organization, uh, I don't think, I think that def may defeat the purpose mm -hmm. ultimately. It depends on the organization. Mm -hmm. But in our organization's case, uh, a, over a decade ago, we just realized that we were that there was this four phase sort of um, un unfolding, mm -hmm. and of course we're not stuck in it. But we realize it just naturally is progressing as those four phases. So we started talking about it more openly since. But yeah, it could be 30, 40 years. It's not about that. But it is this idea of going out of business. It's mm -hmm. the idea that it shouldn't be dependent on individuals or organizations. That this is part of something bigger, which is human progress and and how do we think and how do we engage. And ultimately, we'd like to see a world where favela informal settlements are not seen as the other. They're seen as part of how we've developed um, and they need and that have and and that there are differences between slums or shanty towns or uh, new settlements where people want nothing more than, than an alternative um, and consolidated communities that have built a history, that have a strong sense of place, a strong sense of belonging, mm -hmm. who want to stay there, who want to invest in those places. And um, the reason the memory and culture working group is so active within the Sustainable Favela Network is because we realize that if people don't feel a sense of place and belonging, they're not going to take care of their environment. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, so we, we, we're building a world where people migrate and move, and, and so we need to really think about how do we build that sense of place and identity mm -hmm. um, and belonging. And anyway, so I'm sort of extrapolating. No, but that's great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'll be a little provocative at the end. We've talked about organizing for uh, almost two hours and no one's mentioned the word power. Um, and, and so Mary, can you talk a little bit about in terms of sort of trying to privilege local knowledge um, um, and bottom up and top down. Um, the top down tends to have more power. Um, and so I'm just curious how you think about power um, when you think about trying to sort of scaffold or lift up local knowledge. Um, and sort of how have you used community organizing tactics to sort of think about building more power for folks to have more, more agency in their lives? Yeah, you know, I, 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 th I think it might just be my delicate Canadian sensibility because <laughs> we're nice. <laughs> um, that community organizing often feels to Canadians, and I'd be interested in other people from other places, whether you have this experience, community organizing feels more adversarial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, coming out of the American experience, and so maybe organizing communities is a more comfortable mm. place for me than community organizing. Mm. Sorry, Saul. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I think, uh, I'll just wear a different hat for a second and say that and I was concerned about this a little bit when we were in the, on the site tour. The way to build power is to build economic uh, independence. Mm. Mm. And so if, if we're not all pushing on whether a, a basic uh, universal income mm. or whatever, whatever that is going to end up being, um, mm. I think that is coming. I think that uh, in the jurisdiction that I was in, we tried to pilot to see if we could actually make it happen. It's going to take many pilots, but I think there has to be a base financial capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I'd say. Because I think we can organize all, the, all we like, but mm -hmm. if people are poor and unable to exercise any kind of autonomy, then it doesn't really help the organizing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing, though, I would say is that I do think this is where I back to, I want to befriend the technology people I already pissed off. I just want to win them back and just say that I do think that knowledge is power. And the technology piece is equipping people with their access to, to knowledge, which they probably always had, but now they can verify it. And I think that increasingly powers who are more resourced 
are more anxious now mm -hmm. about the fact that local folks may in fact have access to information mm -hmm. and data and they can't be, nothing mm -hmm. can be pulled over mm -hmm. them anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things, I think we should make it, I think we need to get serious about taxation and create a basic universal income and then I think we need to identify and, and recognize, use our power, use the power we have. Um, I just want to say, the third thing I want to just say if I could, not yeah. really in your question. That's it. I can't believe how unevolved we are on the public participation um, public consultation field. I've been at it for so many years and mm. I just can't get over it that when we mm. sit in here, the way public meetings are being done, they're being done the same way mm. 20 mm. years later, 30 years. Really? Like, have we, come on, you techies, can't you come up with some fabulous new way to make us make collect, collective decisions? Mm -hmm. All right, so I have five minutes and someone's at the mic. State your name and your questions in the form of a question. What? Anne says I can go over. What happened to start on time, end on time? <laughs> That's for the organizers in the house. Okay, give us your name. Terrence Johnson. Rose, thank you. I heard you speaking in a language in which everyone could understand, as Malcolm X used to say, or sounding as Fannie Lou Hamer when she said she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. You said people, people are looked at as objects. If we don't talk, we become dependent, we are not beggars, we don't want a book and pen, uh, and to form partnerships among ourselves. And you mentioned another advice, review data, merging formal and informal, and you gave examples about the cheating, the pregnancy, and so forth. Um, can you speak about another reality? In light of all that you said, people, that have been broken down so much or feel that way that they feel they don't have anything left. And we can give examples of substance abuse, violence, crime, mental illness, and so on. Can you talk about how do you build people up to fight? Mm -hmm. How do you build people up to fight? How do you keep them motivated to keep being part of the work? Okay, we are always making noise. Mm -hmm. We are not fighting, we are engaging. Mm -hmm. And then the engagement creates projects that attract people mm -hmm. because they are doing it by themselves. What we are building is confidence within the people. We build pride mm -hmm. within the people. We, we, we build sense of ownership. What, what we are creating within our process is to own the process. We, 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 we are not creating a process that is driven by somebody. Because if somebody is leading us, we get tired quickly. Mm. But if we drive our own process, we know that today we can build one house, then 10 people still need 10 houses. So we continue to help each, we motivate each other on a daily basis. That is why I was saying earlier that exchange programs are so important because mm. people get excited when they visit each other. When, when I come to Woodland next time without you people, I become, <laughs> I become very happy that I'm part of Chicago. Mm. You take an mm. ordinary slum dweller to come to America who have never seen America in their lives. They just read it from the map. But immediately when you set your foot in America, you start to pinch yourself. Yeah. Is it me in America? This place, I saw it on a map. Yeah. Then that person become motivated and then continue to motivate others. So it, it is not just to be there to, to accept what you are given, but it is to have pride in driving your own destiny. And then building one person, it's to build an individual, build a family, build a neighborhood, build a community, build a nation, and ultimately build a society. Mm -hmm. So if we build a society, because we want to be city driven rather than individual driven mm. and then if we are all together we motivate each other not to give up on what we want to achieve but because giving up destroys your feeling you become so 
frustrated that you end up locking yourself into your own little cabin. But when we go out continuously fighting, policy of government is there forever and they are always being reviewed, reviewed, reviewed. Every year there's a review. After five years, new politicians. So we have to be empowered to get used to engaging with them in every day of their lives. And then we, we enjoy being nuisance to them, making them to work. Because if we don't become nuisance, they will always be sit in their office, looking at the laptops, playing games, and making telephones the whole day, and not addressing the real issues. But we don't get tired. We make them to listen. Yeah. We enjoy being part of this process. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. Okay. Can you give us your name? Um, I'm Eunice Waka. And my, OK, before this, panel spoke, I was hearing a lot of activism, the back and forth with the government, and I'm like, hmm, maybe it's different for first world countries, but in our countries, such scenarios, they're riddled by a lot of bureaucracy, politics, and corruption, so the systems take years when the problems are here and now, hmm. but we create a situation where the people also believe that they can't progress without government help. So how do we change that narrative um, for the people who previously thought they were el uh, helpless from the government's need to do something so that something can change to the people can create something with the resources that they have presently to change something. And on the same note, how do we exploit the community as a resource with, uh, without making the government feel like they don't need to do anything after that? Because we have situations where, like in my community, okay. Um, there was a time where there was like a huge drought and we needed to get water. So uh, my dad was one of the panelists who were chosen by the community to talk to the government officers. But in the whole bureaucratic process, he, he realized that this might take years. And the problem is people mm. are starving here and now. So he, he organized, he's like, I'm an engineer, my daughter is an architect. And we have people who have built canals um, traditionally. So they were able to build uh, their own like makeshift well. But at the end of the day, as they were, because water was provided at some point in mm -hmm. their own way, the government decided that they, they don't need to do anything after that. Mm. So that's the situation um, um, I want to ask, how do we prevent such situations? But at the same time, making the communities um, build upon the resources that they have naturally. So it's the, this balance between community organizing as a response to government failure, um, but you still need governments to function and communities to participate. Have, do folks have stories that might respond to sort of that challenge and tension? Mm -hmm. Teresa? Okay. Um, so there are some favelas in Rio where they have, where are you? There you are. There are some favelas in Rio where they've been waiting for government for decades. Mm -hmm. and. They're some of the ones with the worst outcomes in terms of precarious, uh, government doesn't come, they send letters, they <clears throat> request, they pressure, but government doesn't show up. And there are favelas where people self-organize as much as they can and build even their own sewage systems without treatment, but getting the sewage out of the homes, et cetera, really organize both streets and create their own postal service. Mm. And those actually are in a much, end up being in a much better position to advocate because they, they've self-organized. They've built a, a unity, they've built cohesion, they've built a reputation, they've built, and so those communities end up actually being more effective than it getting government to come in and set that sewage system into the formal system or not evict them because they're not in living in such poor conditions, et cetera. So um, I don't think they necessarily need to conflict and then thinking about, there are a couple of interesting things, so stories. So there's, you know, in the UK, there's the transition towns movement, which is spread around the world, but it's strong in the UK. And it's a movement of people who decide they're gonna make their community transition to post-carbon and how they, and they've got a long step process of how they organize their neighborhoods. Um, and it starts with getting together with your neighbors and developing projects. And later on, step eight or 10, is to actually start engaging with the government. 
And it's a similar process. It's this idea if the government comes right away, you're going to be on their terms anyway. So you really want to be self-organized. And um, there's a favela in Rio that's the one that I showed with the lead neighborhood development comparison. They're very organized, um, and they've done a lot of their own sort of community planning. Uh, but um, a, a, a student at Harvard studying SEPTED, which is community uh, criminal, uh, crime prevention through environmental design, right? So she came to Rio, and she spent some time in this community because it's a community that doesn't have drug trafficking, doesn't have strong militia in the, in the community. It's in the region, and it's been able to keep crime out uh, partly through design. So she studied how they did this, and it's, her list starts, number one, don't wait for the government. Number two, and then it's all these activities, and in the end, keep pressing for needed services. So it's that same logic seems to appear over and over, at least in our experience, that it's good to self-organize, it's good to build unity, it's good to build community, um, but yes, you have to pressure. And then finally, um, there's an amazing case, which is the Community Land Trust in Puerto Rico. So in San Juan, Puerto Rico, a group of eight informal settlements, 20 years ago when the government said, we're going to dredge the canal, clean this up, and we're going to give you all individual titles, this set of communities said, we don't want individual titles because we're, it's going to gentrify. We're next to the financial district. We've been here 80 years. We don't, most of our people don't want to leave. And they actually studied all the options on earth, looked at the community land trust model, which is very different in applied in North America and Europe. Um, but they retrofitted that model to their settlements and they passed a law. And so they actually collectively own the land. So it's all legal, formalized, et cetera. They collectively own the land through an organization they run as a community. Uh, but they individually own their homes. They can buy and sell their homes, et cetera, um, inherit, et cetera. But because they collect, now they're one of the largest landowners in San Juan as a community. So they're now seen as part, you know, when they go to complain and request services from government, they, they're listened to. Um, and they have a whole plan that the city is implementing in the community, a 25-year plan. Um, and so that was a way to sort of formalize maintaining the assets of informality, which is this community fabric, solidarity, strong community organizing they had there. Uh, and, so, and so have both, right? They self-organize, but they also can pressure for services. Um, I'm mindful of time, but if there are any last comment from Mary or Rose. So I just want to quickly say that where we experience this in Canada is in First Nations. We have hundreds of First Nations in Canada, it's our indigenous population. 85% of them do not have clean drinking water. This is in Canada. And some of them are very urban. And, when you, and some of them have lots of money. And when you go to talk with them, they are caught between they expect the crown, which is how they refer to Canada, the crown to pay for that water service, and they refuse to pay for it themselves. And it's a big, huge, thorny challenge. And what I wonder about is whether the answer may become what you just hinted at, which is that, that, we, that local communities will start developing local solutions that don't tie them into existing infrastructure, and that that innovative piece will become more affordable, and they'll, continue, they'll have more autonomy, and so they'll pursue it, and the government won't, won't stand in their way to do it. Any last mm. final word, Russ? Yeah. I, I think the, the power of information help us to influence government. I, I would like to give an example. We are, we, are, we are now running a very big project in Kenya, in Mukuru, whereby the, the county government, because of the information that we have collected, they have now come on board to say, let's do it together. I can give an, a, another example of Nigeria where there was a community that was facing a strong eviction. But because of the information that the community themselves have collected and started to engage with the city, they are now sitting around the table together and planning on how to do it better. I, I'm just giving two examples, but the other example is of, of our university of the Federation, which is Indian Federation. One day they were telling us the story that the, the municipality of Maharashtra yeah. was given money by the World Bank mm. to do sanitation for the communities. It was very difficult for the city to go into Daravi. Mm -hmm. But now, because the community was so organized, 
they went to the World Bank and said, look, you have given this money almost five years. Nothing has mm -hmm. happened. Can you give us this money? We want to show you that you can do it. Today, they have built over 300 sanitation units with the money that is coming mm -hmm. from World Bank because the municipality couldn't do it. And it has made the partnership to work between the Federation the municipality today if they want to do any relocation instead of evictions mm -hmm. any alternative housing for the poor they engage with the federation so organizing is so important that it helps us to influence policy data collection my final point we are here talking about data mapping and no? data collection but what I would like us to look at, how can we use this data as a tool mm -hmm. to campaign for security of tenure? Because it is important that we don't just collect data that won't bear fruits. Mm -hmm. People are staying there in slums and informal settlements without security of tenure. We can't develop ourselves because we don't know when the next eviction will take place. Mm. But if we can start to use this, this mapping and this information as a tool to try and fight mm -hmm. for security of tenure so that people can own a piece of land, then it will empower and encourage self-development by the people. And it, it will become a city development driven by the people themselves if we know that we are allowed to stay where we are. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, our panelists. <laughs> and thank Mansueto Institute for all your work.